Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast that helps you preach with confidence from the Hebrew Bible. I'm Tim McNinch, a PhD candidate in Hebrew Bible at Emory University and a YouTube celebrity. Yes, you are. Did you get your 20,000 folks I yet? did. I got 20,000 subscribers. Hey, 20,000. That's amazing. <laughs> At least my kids think I'm famous. <laughs> well, you are in so many ways. And I am less famous, but my name is Dr. Rachel Wren, ordained Lutheran minister and assistant professor of biblical studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary. So one of the first reading options for October 3rd goes way back to the beginning to Genesis 2 verses 18 to 24. And Tim is up this week to share some insights (laughs) about how men are superior to women because Adam was created first and Eve was an afterthought made out of leftover flesh. Wow, Rachel, you really hit the nail on the head there. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Until next time, I'm Tim McNinch. You are terrible. (laughs) All right, well... Since you brought up the gender issue in this passage, (laughs) why don't we start with that? Sure. And in order to talk about the genders of the characters in this story, we have to dip into the Hebrew. The mission of God in this story is to produce for the Adam what the NRSV calls a helper as his partner Mm -hmm. in verse 18. In Hebrew, that's ezer kenegdo. First of all, it's worth dispelling any sense that this term means some sort of like inferior helpmate for the man, Mm. a kind of assistant for the male head of creation. The the title, Ezer, helper, is a term that's often applied to God. So Mm. definitely not an inferior post, right? Uh, Mm. The other word in that phrase, konegdo, means in his presence, uh, much like the more common phrase, lefanav, but, but with a sort of stronger, more prominent sense. The related word, nagid, means leader, someone who's out in front. And it's a title that's mm. given to kings. Mm. So, ezer konegdo means something like a partner with a prominent position next to him. Or maybe like a partner just like him. So, God is out to create an equal partner for the Adam. Yeah, I remember I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole a few years back in um, researching this term, Ezer, to kind of just look into mm-hmm. it. And I, I found that, that, you know, God is is most often the being to whom it's applied in the Hebrew Bible. But the other thing I found is is the context in which that word appears is typically when the person needs um, like military exactly. help. Exactly. Like, yes. I saw that too, as I was looking into yeah. it quite often yeah. as a, is a, is a military help. Yeah. So, so the way I was talking about it with my students this year was it's someone who's always got your back. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because Adam itself isn't necessarily a male word or a male term, right? That, yeah, that's exactly right. Adam or Ha Adam is usually translated the man, but it's not a gender inflected term. I mean, it does take masculine verb and pronoun forms, but really that's more a feature of the patriarchally shaped Hebrew language in general and Mm -hmm. not a connotation of the word Adam itself. Mm -hmm. The term, of course, is connected to the ground, Adama, from which Adam was formed in chapter 2, verse 7. So the closest cognate we have in English would be something like human, Uh, Mm. Though it is a bit unusual these days to refer to the soil as humus, uh, (laughs) which is also altogether a different thing from hummus, hummus, the delicious chickpea dip. (laughs) And a roll today. (laughs) (laughs) You might also try the earthling, who was formed from the earth as a translation for Ha'adam. Though I I also think earthling always sounds like something a space alien would say. (laughs) But the point here is that the term Adam is about the human's essential connection to the earth and not about its gender. Mm. The regular term for man, ish, doesn't even show up in the text until after the creation of the woman, isha. Mm. The woman was made in verse 22, and only then is the leftover material of the original Mm. human called ish in verses (laughs) 23 to 24. So you might even say that woman was created before man. Mm. Or probably more faithfully to the narrative, 
woman and man were made from the same original non-binary human. Nice. That's such a great way to say that. And it's so contrary to the way that this text is often presented. Uh, You read it, and I think rightly so, as painting equity between women and men as God's original intent for creation after the creation of the earthling, but before the fall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even more, this whole gender binary is derivative. And it's secondary to this earlier, more fundamental non-binary nature of human, of Adam. Absolutely. And you know, you Mm -hmm. could use a whole sermon to dwell on just that point, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's so central and unfortunately so contrary to how the story is usually uh, traditionally read. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I want to say that for the author of the story, there are other themes that are just as important here. Okay, what are you picking up on? Uh, Well, for starters, the point that I mentioned in passing just a couple minutes ago, that humanity is essentially connected to the ground, to the earth. Mm. I think the big question of Genesis 2 to 3 overall is how humans came to be so much like the gods. Mm. And Genesis 2 emphasizes that we are not gods. We don't walk upon the earth. We are earth. Mm. We are part of the ecosystem. Earth isn't just our home. It's our substance. Mm -hmm. From dust we're Mm -hmm. formed into dust we return, right? So in this story, even all of the animals and birds were formed just like the human, out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So there's an interconnectedness between humanity, all life, and the ground itself. Our sort of illusory godlikeness, says Genesis 3 in the next chapter, is the result of sinful overreach, mm. which resulted in an enlightened consciousness, yes, but also a cursed existence and a deadly limitation. Mm. All of this has huge implications for the way that we see our relationship to the earth. Addressing climate change, for example, is not just about keeping earth habitable for humanity. It's about stewarding our own essential substance. Earth care is self-care in a Mm. profoundly pragmatic sense. And this is the witness of both biological science and, as it turns out, the creation mythology of the Bible. Nice. When we think of the earth as a resource to be exploited, which has been the dominant model since the Industrial Revolution at least, We're perpetrating a lie with disastrous consequences for the earth and for us as earth ourselves. Exactly. I remember the moment when I was reading, um, I was doing some exegesis on Genesis 2, and I got to the part in uh, Genesis 2, verse 15, really familiar part. The Lord God took the Adam and put it in the Garden of Eden Mm -hmm. to till it. And when I looked at that word, the word till in Hebrew is actually eved which is the same word for to serve. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh my goodness, how different would it be if we read this story as we were put here to, to watch over it, which is the next verb, mm-hmm. shamar, exactly. and to serve it, to serve it. Yeah, yeah. It just gives a whole different spin on the way that the earth has been treated for so long. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. You got any other spins to yeah, throw out there too? Yeah, the, the other thing here that's worth dwelling on for a moment is the theme of marriage which is in this text. The, the structure of the text actually frames this whole mythology of Ezer Kenegdo and the naming of the animals and the creation of woman and man as a kind of etiology or explanation story for marriage. This is signaled by the big therefore, Alken, in verse 24. Now, a lot of hay has been made about how this text clearly defines marriage as the union between one man and one woman. Mm. So it's worth thinking this through a bit, especially if you're going to use this text in a sermon. No. Now, I think it's helpful to recognize and accept that this text does indeed present a heteronormative view of marriage as a male-female union. That's just mm. the, the plain sense of the text that's there. That is, the author of this text views the union of a man and woman as the typical mechanism that they've observed by which the generation of a new family unit takes place. Uh, Notice the prominence there of leaving behind father and mother to form Mm -hmm. a new family unit. Mm -hmm. When this leaving and cleaving happens, 
It <laughs> replicates in each generation the one fleshness, that non-binary sense of the original mm -hmm. Adam, the original humanity. And that's what this text is trying to explain. Mm -hmm. When we look at that, though, with some theological precision, I would say that the author of this text is not giving the biblical, quote-unquote, definition of marriage. Mm. Instead, they're giving a mythological explanation for the social phenomenon of generational family units, explaining how each generation is Adam all over again. Mm, nice. And the mechanism of heterosexual marriage, to which the author refers here, is a culturally conditioned social phenomenon, mm. just as other family dynamics described in the Bible, like polygamy and hmm. marital rape, patriarchy, mm. sibling warfare, inheritance customs, all that kind of stuff, are also culturally conditioned social phenomena and decidedly not a biblical, quote-unquote, definition of family values. Mm. So the transferable theological point of this text is that humans are more connected to each other than to any other creature, and therefore each generation of human community gets to be Adam again. And I'd say that heterosexual marriage is still a manifestation of this human oneness, but so is homosexual marriage, and so are other forms of intimate community, including deep friendship. Mm. Instead of placing a boundary around marriage, I think this text is highlighting the expansive potential of human community for unity, for a breaking down of the binaries that divide us in order for us to be God's agents in creation. Mm. And, you know, in a, in a narrative sense, as we look at how the story unfolds, this passage is setting up the chaos that's going to erupt in the next several chapters when the binaries take over, Right dividing yeah. male and female, brother against brother, people against people. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, especially if you're thinking of this as sort of pre-fall. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking of this as a time almost before binaries existed, if you could say that, even though the Adam was just created and then divided into Ish and Isha, um, it's still almost just like, you know, earthling one, earth thing one, thing two, <laughs> you could always call it. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, that's great. How would you go about preaching all of this goodness? Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a lot of theological reflection. But in a sermon, I, I would use some of my time to break down the traditional gendered heteronormative interpretations of, of this passage. I think that's still important work that should be done in a homiletical context. But I would spend most of my time, if I'm preaching this text, really opening up the expansiveness of this fascinating mythology as it finds concrete expression in many of the forms of uh, intimate human community. Mm. The bottom line of this, of this text, I think, is that it's not good, lo tov, right? Lo tov yeah. for the human to be <laughs> isolated. Mm -hmm. God made Adam to be a social being. Mm -hmm. So where are the ezer kenegdos? with whom we can partner and with whom we can be community and discover the fullness of human potential. Mm, mm, lovely. You can, you can tell your congregation, you know, get out your phone and text your Ezer Kenegdo, whoever it might be. <laughs> it's your grandma, your spouse, your partner, your best friend. Yeah. Uh, that's lovely. Well, fun. Well, thanks so much for that, Tim. I think that that's a, a well-known text that has some great potential that has yet to be explored. So thanks for throwing all that out there. No problem. Folks, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Check us out on Facebook where we drop our weekly episodes or find a fantastic backstash of our previous episodes. You can get those at firstreadingpodcast.com. Send us some feedback or give us a rating. We love to hear what's working and what can be improved. Special thanks to Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University for a generous grant that's helping us do what we love best. Thanks to all of you who are listening. And until next time, I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. Have a great week. <laughs>